Welcome to Ameri Clerkships, everyone. My name is Dr. Mizani. I am the Chief Clinical Officer here at Ameri Clerkships, and uh, today's presentation is on U.S. residency match tips for international medical students and recent graduates. Uh, I'm a former resident selection committee member for the two different residency programs, and uh, I'm the uh, uh, also one of the founders of Ameri Clerkships, uh, acmedical.org. Um, and uh, I'm a family physician by training. That was the former chief of uh, Morehouse uh, Department of Family Medicine uh, residency program. So hopefully we can bring a lot of behind closed door tips and uh, advice to you so that your application could become um, more competitive and stronger as you go through the annual match process. I'm joined over here by Mr. Tim Zellinger. Um, Tim is our operations manager and he's going to be moderating our, um, our chats. So with no further ado, our disclaimer is that test marks and test names and trademarks such as uh, ERAS, ECFMG, uh, SOAP, Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program, MSVE, uh, NRMP, USMLE, NBME, Main Residency Match, they're all the property of their respective trademark holders and they're not affiliated with American Clerkships in any way. And so the, today's topics that we're going to be discussing is going to be the American Academy of Family Physicians National Conference in Kansas City, and which is um, for this year is July 25th to 27th. So I'm going to give you some tips and advice for what to do uh, when you go there. If you haven't, you know, if, if you're planning on going there, and if you haven't, hopefully I can convince you uh, to register for it and attend. It's quite a once in a uh, it's 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 a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, and uh, next we're going to talk about recommended rotations for matching into certain specialties. And we're going to talk about letters of recommendation and how those recommended rotations play a, a, a key role in them. Transferring in between medical schools, I think that's a topic that has come up uh, quite often, especially amongst our Caribbean medical students. Uh, IMG friendlies. And uh, next, we're uh, going to uh, repost this uh, webinar as a YouTube world premiere on July 18, 2019 at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you have enough if you're uh, if you weren't able to attend um, today, or if you have additional questions that was not answered today, then please make sure you come there. I will be uh, moderating the chat uh, in a live Q and A fashion. It's a lot of fun, really active. I think you'll really enjoy it. So the WAFP National Conference. This is an annual event that is put together by uh, American Academy of Family Physicians, and the 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 point of this meeting is for. Uh, not only for you to get to become more familiar with family medicine here in the United States, but also there's going to be over 200 family medicine residency programs. Actually, this year is expected to be over 300. And um, these are all little mini interview sessions that you could have with all the representatives of, of different residency programs from across the country. And it's a really good opportunity for you to differentiate between what internal medicine does and what family medicine does and get to talk to uh, residents, get to talk to family physicians and and draw those correlations, draw a lot of differences between what family medicine does and and um, and uh, what is, it's gonna give you a good um, little snippet of what's gonna be expected of you in the actual interview. So you'll see a lot of medical students, a lot of them from the United States, a lot of international medical students and, and, uh, and, and medical graduates up to two years post graduating from medical school. So those are the individuals that are allowed to uh, to attend this event. Uh, and when you go there, you'll see some medical students that are in, you know, in lab coats and you see some of them that are in, in normal street clothes and, and, uh, but they're just walking from station to station during the exhibition period, which is not the entire time. Um, but they'll just go station to station and they'll walk from one residency to the next and, and they'll start talking with all the, the program directors and chief residents. And the, you know, some of the tips that I could give you when I did it is that you, you're just not going to have enough time to get to all of the residency programs. And but if you if you plan it properly, and you don't try to oversell yourself when you're there, and uh, you know the tables are kind of turned a little bit at the national conference when where some of the residency programs are trying to sell their residency program to you and want you to apply to them. And uh, so it's a really good way for them to stay in touch with you, for you to stay in touch with them, and when you apply. Kind of remind the program director that you know you met at the national conference, and usually it leads to a few interviews if you do uh, if you do a really good job there. Um, there's also some great workshops. Uh, it's not just about meeting residency programs. Again, it really gives you a good uh, idea about what family medicine is about and what it is that family physicians are really standing for, and um, and then uh, gives you an opportunity to get involved. and uh, And there is the link right there uh, for the national conference. If I click it, I like to usually just take you there just so that you see. Uh, what the website is about, and uh, <clears throat> uh, usually here's the Expo Hall, and the Expo Hall 
And, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of questions to ask the exhibitors. And uh, here's a question for you to ask residency programs. So even, even it's completely expected of you to, um, to, to get there and mingle with program directors and, and residency uh, representatives. So it's a really, really good uh, opportunity. So take a look at this website. There's a lot of information here. Uh, but if you are still a medical student and or if you're within two years of graduating from medical school, you still are qualified to go there. Uh, so don't lose this opportunity. It's quite a wonderful, amazing experience. I've seen many people match as a result of just going um, to the national conference. So AFP National Conference, we covered it. Next, the uh, a topic that often comes up um, with our medical students that are visiting us uh, from abroad is uh, clinical clerkships. And uh, so in addition to uh, our mentorship services, a lot of you have joined the American clerkships because of our clinical clerkships. And uh, there are uh, state policies uh, from one state to the next uh, about who can do clinical rotations in their states. Uh, many of them don't have a policy, but, uh, but those that do, they're pretty serious about it. And those policies change all the time. And if you've worked with American clerkships before, then you know that we take that pretty seriously. And, and uh, we, um, we discuss those policies with you and then we allow you to decide. Some of the states we don't place any students uh, for credit in, for example, New York, uh, New Jersey, uh, Florida, uh, California, we don't place any medical student for credit in those states because of their, their really rigid uh, regulations. So, um, you know, we I do ask that you, at least you, you can't figure out everything 50 states, but um, but come to our office hours and, and discuss your, your ultimate goals. Where is your family? Where do you want to, do your clinical clerkships and we'll talk with you. We'll let you know where is the nearest state if you can do clinicals in that state, whether your medical school is approved in that state for you to, um, uh, to do clinical rotations, whether there's any additional processing. And the reason why all of this is important is because as a medical student, when you're doing four credit clinicals versus not for credit, which is also like an observership, uh, which you're doing it recreationally just to go out and build your CV, maybe you're doing as a, as a, as a summer observership program to build your resume. Um, the difference is that a medical student doing clinicals for credit, clerkships for credit, they're, they're able to practice limited medicine. And what do I mean by that? Um, as you recall, when you're doing clinical rotations, if you're doing it for credit, whether abroad or here in the United States, a lot of times you get to share your diagnosis with the patient. And a lot of times you get to share your treatment with the patient, obviously within uh, under supervision. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the limited practice practice of medicine and the state medical boards uh, want to make sure that the patients are protected. And so when you share your opinion with someone, the state medical board has a direct responsibility to, to protect um, the, the, the citizens of their state. And so that's why it's called limited practice of medicine and under supervision. There are rules by which international medical students can engage in limited practice of medicine if they've been processed properly through um, either the state medical board, such as in New Jersey and New York and Florida, and uh, or if they've been properly processed through the hospital um, or if their physician is a, a faculty at a U.S. medical school, uh, you know, so all of those things make a difference. And so speak with the mayor clerkships, uh, residency enrollment strategist, and we'll be able to put you in the in the state that um, you're going to meet their requirements and you'll be able to get your clinical clerkships done. But if you're doing these clinicals not for credit um, outside of your medical school, then uh, really is being done during your vacation time. Um, you're not going to be uh, talking about diagnosis and treatment with the patients. You're not even going to introduce yourself as a medical student. You're just there as an observer. Um, uh, and uh, you can communicate with people, but certainly you don't want to make yourself look like you're a medical student there doing medical student type clinical clerkships. So assuming that you're doing four credit clinical clerkships, there are really four main categories of clinical clerkships. There used to be five, but now with with the doctor of osteopathy, DO residencies going away and everything being observed under ACGME um, uh, umbrella, so there are really four def different categories of, uh, of clinical clerkships. The first one is community healthcare experience, CHE. So this is mainly outpatient. Um, and um, there's there's really nothing wrong with doing inpatient versus outpatient. It really is um, has a lot to do with, uh, with your own personal preference, with if your medical school has particular requirements for uh, the specialty that you're doing, for example, if you're doing OBGYN or if you're doing general surgery and if there's no inpatient at all, then certainly that's not a good experience when it comes to that specialty. It's a good experience for you being around that physician, but you only get a little snippet of one part of that specialty. And we certainly want you to have a, a well-rounded experience. So a lot of times where a specialty may be available to a graduate in one state, we may recommend that you go to another state as a student doing four credit so that you could get a, a more well-rounded experience and also 
to meet your medical school's requirement. Um, next one is the teaching hospital guarantee. That's the second category, and that means that um, you will have hospital exposure and that hospital is considered teaching uh, under one of three uh, premises. Number one is that um, they uh, either have, uh, they're listed in ACGNE uh, website as a participating site for residency programs. So that's the first um, uh, reason why a, uh, a hospital would be considered teaching. Second one is um, if they're listed with, uh, with the American Osteopathic Association, uh, so that would make it a teaching hospital as well. And then thirdly, if they serve as a teaching site for U.S. medical student for their clinical clerkship, so that would make it a teaching hospital as well. Um, and then uh, the third category are verified. And what that means is that American Clerkships has a contract with um, a teaching hospital, and you're going to be processed through their uh, either their medical staff office or their medical education office, and um, and um, you know, you'll, you'll be given an ID badge uh, under most cases uh, and and you'll be, you know, everything is above board and the hospital is aware and you're not just being attached to a physician, but also the hospital uh, wants to process you too and there is a contract and uh, with the mayor clerkships and the hospital. And the reason why that's important is a lot of times uh, the state medical boards, you know, many years in the future, they may ask, okay, so was there a contract in place? And, um, and so, you know, that just allows us to say yes uh, in times like that, if, if you're ever asked. Um, and then the fourth category is teaching hospital guarantee with um, MD residencies verified. And, and we're, we're working on that. Uh, that is not available just yet, uh, but that is the fourth category. But um, majority of our international medical students are in teaching hospital guarantee verified, uh, where they get processed just like any other medical students and, and they do their clinical clerkships there. So those are the four different categories of uh, clinical clerkships. Now, how do clerkships, USMLEs, and initial medical licensure kind of work together? Um, I want you to delineate between initial medical licensure and a training medical licensure. Initial licensure is the first time that you get a full medical license uh, in a state in the United States to practice medicine. Whereas a training license, the requirements for getting a training license could be significantly less. Uh, than, well, usually is, than, than an initial licensure. Sometimes some states, like for example, California or Georgia, when I was uh, going to residency, um, all the program has to do is they have to say, well, this individual has just been matched into my program and uh, you know, please go ahead and issue a training license for them and they'll issue a training license for the entire duration of the residency. They're assuming that you're gonna complete that residency. And so that's a training license. But you know, about six months before training is done, you're gonna be required to, to apply for an initial license wherever you want to practice. Um, and so, so it's important for you to start thinking about that right now because some states uh, will um, monitor the quality of clinical clerkships that you uh, completed as a medical student before they allow you to start residency and before they give you a training license. And that's what makes this a little bit more complicating. Uh, because for example, uh, let me see, for example, the state of New York. Um, what the state of New York requires is that, um, uh, you know, if you're doing short term, which is less than 12 weeks versus long term uh, clinical rotations, regardless of what it is, you, you have to go through and have a sponsor within that state uh, through the graduate medical education. And if it's going to be over 12 weeks, then, then the name of your medical school needs to be on an approved list. If it's less than 12 weeks, as long as you've got a graduate medical education, sponsorship that means directly a residency program in the state of new york says sure no problem you can come and join us for you know x period of time it's got to be less than 12 weeks and and those are um you know that's that's what i mean by that and why is that important because if you if you if you ever match into new york uh then they're going to come back and say well i see that you've done a clinical rotation here in the state of new york we want to make sure that you did it correctly and then they're going to have a, a, a clerkship verification form that you need to complete um, so that's why that's why it's important for you to know which states you're uh, you're doing your clinical clerkships in and uh, and what states you're going to be applying for licensure. And so depending on your particular circumstance, uh, you know, we may recommend that you not apply for residency in certain states. So it's really, really important that you know, once you become an American clerkships member to come to an office hour, which I'm doing those um, five times a week now. Uh, two of them are dedicated to uh, document analysis, which is letters of recommendation and MSB analysis. And then the other three days are uh, for residency prep uh, Q&A. And so come to one of the office hours and, and describe your situation. Let's go ahead and figure out um, if there's any known issues. And uh, and it also gives you a, a good head start in, in uh, preparing yourself for 
uh, not just applying to residency, but really thinking bigger picture because once you match, you want to be able to get started with that residency. And, and it's, uh, it's not a good feeling at all if, if you match and you can't get started in that residency for one of these um, you know, regulations that, that cannot be overcome. Or, or it could have been overcome that be just avoided, um, uh, you know, taking a couple of uh, additional steps. Next thing, the other thing that um, really comes up a lot are USMLE attempts and the seven-year law uh, as they pertain to medical licensure. So uh, I have this link here for you through the Federation State Medical Board. And uh, so as you look down here, for example, I'm just going to go ahead and do control F attempts, right? So for example, in the in Alabama, um, uh, for this is for for initial medical licensure, which is different, different, uh, most likely different than than training license. You would actually have to call each one of these states that you're planning on applying to residencies to, and ask them if if any of these USMLEs apply to you. Ask them a uh, Do you require that? As a as a resident, that we have a training license uh, or you know uh, a training or a residence license in order to get into residency, and if and if they do, do they have the same USMLE uh, and licensing exam limitations as they do for their initial licensure? So those are the two questions that you wanna um, uh, you wanna ask. And so, for example, just looking at Alabama, uh, they have um, they have requirements on the number of attempts at, at licensing exams. So fourth attempt at USMLE step three. That's a, that's a lot of attempts, but you know, four attempts. So if you've, if you haven't passed step three on the uh, um, on the fourth attempt, and if you uh, haven't had formal training after the third attempt, then they they won't uh, they won't want you to be licensed there. And those are those are uh, very that you know hard set uh, rules that those states have. 10 attempts at all USMLEs and then no limit on complex, which that has to do with our, our osteopathic students and, and graduates. As far as time limits, for example, Alabama has seven years to successfully complete all USMLE exams. Now this uh, pertains to, you know, in most of the states, it's the first time you pass a, a USMLE exam, but in, um, in, um, in uh, some states, it's the first time you sat for a USMLE. So that seven year could um, start at either one. Again, you need to ask. Unfortunately, there's not there's not a unified source that, that I can send you to. There used to be a book that American Medical Association used to publish and you could buy it. It was called The State Licensure Requirements. And unfortunately, they haven't produced it since 2014. So uh, it was a great book. And uh, if you can get your hands on it, then, then please get it. But in the meantime, uh, we just have to Continue to communicate with one another, and hopefully, we get your your questions answered. So that's FSMB. All right. So next, we're going to talk about recommended rotations, and let's say what specialty do you want to match into? And uh, one of the most common themes of of my office hours when a medical student comes is to 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 speak with me about their application. Is if we haven't really, you know, if I haven't met them enough, at least two three times before. Uh, they're really deep into their clinical rotations. Uh, one of the things that we see is that they don't really ask for any letters of recommendation until everything is done. And unfortunately, one of the one of the issues that they face is you know out of sight, out of mind. And so if you wait too long till after your you know if you if you leave a clinical rotation site and you're expecting that the physician is going to totally remember you, you know a year down the line or even a few weeks down the line you know a lot of times they they forget or they get really busy and they have other obligations physicians change practices um you know they just have other obligations that they want to that they're concerned with and and, and our residency application is not at the top of their list so um in addition to some of the advice that i'll you know both the general advice is make sure that you you try to do your best to walk away with a letter of recommendation at the end of each rotation how do you do that um I'll talk about that later on in the Q&A section. Um, but make sure that the order by which you do your rotation makes sense for that specialty. And so if you're thinking about applying to one of these categorical positions, categorical just means that the, the, the funding uh, for you, if you match there, is going to be for the entire duration of uh, prescribed time for that residency. So family medicine is typically three years. There are some four-year family medicine programs. Um, internal medicine is three years, general surgery is five years, psychiatry is four years, peds is three years, OBGYN, um, you know, four to five years. So uh, let's say just look at family medicine, for example. You want to have obviously your core family medicine. So one, either four weeks or six weeks family medicine rotation that you're doing. Then you want to repeat it. Then you want to repeat it again, right? And the reason why you're doing that is you want to start to establish that, look, um, I love family medicine the first time I did it. 
I repeated it as an elective. I repeated it again and as an elective. So I have a pretty good experience of family medicine is like in three different settings because you know each specialty is different in every single clinical site, every single hospital, every single outpatient clinic. So by doing three um, family medicines, you're establishing your commitment to that specialty. Then you want to do, you want to go ahead and make sure that you have at least maybe a pediatrics and a psychiatry in there. Um, family medicine really um, likes their residents who are really strong in peds, really likes residents who are really strong in psych. And so if you do that and then you're doing those clinicals in peds and psych and you let the attending physician know that, look, you, you know, you, uh, of course, you, you love pediatrics. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking of applying to family medicine, so you'd really appreciate it if the pediatrician could, um, could teach you pediatrics from, you know, for, for family physicians from the eyes of a pediatrician, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we need to figure out at what point do we, you know, refer a, a, one of our PEDS cases to a pediatrician or maybe even a pediatric subspecialist uh, versus just keep them in our family medicine um, clinic and, and, and handle it. Uh, same thing with psychiatry. At which point do we handle um, psych, uh, psychiatric um, cases? And at which point do we transfer them out and, and refer them out to a psychiatrist? The same theme follows through for all of the, the six uh, core specialties, which is the majority, 95, 96% of what our um, uh, AmeriCollegiate's uh, medical students and well, members apply to. And then you have some outlying uh, specialties, such as your preliminaries, um, advanced uh, positions, and, and other matches. Preliminaries, for example, internal medicine preliminary, their general surgery preliminary, um, you know, their transitional, which is also a one-year program, uh, and uh, and those are meant to be the PGY one for an advanced specialty. And what are advanced specialties? Anesthesiology, child neurology, dermatology, uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, neurology, uh, physical medicine and rehab, um, osteopathic, uh, muscular, uh, skeletal. Um, uh, OMM, uh, it's for, uh, and many of our radiology, uh, radio, uh, uh, radonc, and then, uh, nuclear, uh, medicine. And so, and then you have ophthalmology, which is a PGY through, through, uh, San Francisco match, which requires a PGY one, uh, that you've done an IM preliminary or transitional, or even maybe a categorical, if you've done a PGY one, it gets pretty complicated when you get into the preliminaries, advanced and, and other matches. Uh, which majority of people don't really get into it. Some of our medical graduates uh, start to, you know, they're pretty serious about those, but for the most part, majority of you are going to fall into one of the, the, the top six that I mentioned. And, um, and if your rotations aren't really set up that way, uh, then and, and maybe, if, maybe you can find three OBGYNs, um, all teaching hospital guarantee verified in one city. Maybe you need to go to different locations, um, and maybe we only have two. Um, you can either try to set one up on your own or or you then do maybe a gynonc or urogynecology. And some people use uh, general surgery, and but then they just kind of focus on the, the GYN uh, surgery aspect of general surgery as they uh, have the attending physician write them the letter of recommendation. So here's the recommended rotations. And as you can see, there's you know a, a lot of overlap between the letters of recommendation and how things look for um, you know right before September 15th uh, and what kind of letters of recommendation you need. So if you know, obviously you're here and you're a medical student, you still have the opportunity to kind of think about what is your application going to look like? I know you're busy with USMLEs, I know you're busy with your clinical clerkships, but I want you to really kind of squeeze this in there too, to make sure that in, in a year from now, in six months from now, in two years from now, when we speak with one another, we don't have to worry about this and that we've had a good plan of action as you were going through your clinical rotation. Because once you graduate, you usually can't go back and redo anything. And so we have to really think about this right now. So this is our wish list. This is what we like to see. We like to see three family medicine letters of recommendation, um, then maybe one from pediatrics and maybe one from psychiatry, depending on the content of the letters. Whichever one is the strongest, that's the one we would recommend as the fourth letter. But you definitely want three from your core specialty and maybe one to two from related specialties, so that um, you know, so that we can see which one is the strongest one and then and then uh, help you do that, uh, use that. If you're thinking about you know like a PGY one, PGY two. Um, combination uh, match, which means that you would have to um, go through the match twice. You're, you're matching for your PGY1, you're also matching for your PGY2. So for neurology, um, you would want to do uh, three neurology plus psychiatry or um, maybe the internal medicine. Uh, I, I should have put that in here. Maybe the internal medicine, because you still need to show your PGY1 uh, IM preliminary or transition that you're going to be able to survive. 
uh, your PGY1 and then to also impress the neurology PGY2 programs um, so that uh, they would uh, really believe that you have a chance uh, in their PGY2. Not all PGY2s are advanced. Uh, like for example, neurology also has a PGY1 as well, but you know, it's a split. There's a lot of them that do not have a PGY1 and they're just PGY2 forward and uh, a lot of them that have PGY1 as well. So just be mindful of that. Uh, the combinations are, are pretty endless. If, you know, if you, a lot of times you go to a medical school and it's not what we expected it to be. And, um, and then we hear of a new medical school that's just opened up or a new opportunity that comes up. And uh, it's really enticing. And a lot of people uh, take that opportunity and they, uh, and they, um, you know, they, they, they transfer from one medical school to another and they don't really think about it much. I mean, it's just, it's a pretty bad situation to be in if you're not happy with your medical school. And at that point, all you're really thinking about is, I need to get out of that situation. So I get that. Um, but, I, but a lot of times these, these transfers are, are done because of poor planning as well. Like for example, uh, you know, somebody didn't understand the, the significance of passing the USMLEs as their school had required them to, and they just didn't focus enough on the USMLEs and they retook it four or five times. And the school says, look, enough is enough. I can't have you here anymore. Uh, I, I need you to, you know, we can't have you here and they would expel the, the students. So that happens sometimes. Um, but other reasons, um, you know, if there has been, you know, if the school has lost their financial aid, that could, that could really, um, cause you to, uh, move from one medical school to the next. There's some family issues. Sometimes that is, we see that a lot, but regardless, these are all red flags uh, in your application and you need to address it. So as soon as we get to the medical education section of your application and we see the name of two medical schools there, that is a red flag because in the U.S., usually people don't transfer, right? I've never seen a single student transfer from one medical school to the next, un to the next unless it's been like the medical school shut down. I don't know of the last medical school that shut down. Um, so I've personally never seen that happen in the United States. I see it all the time amongst Caribbean applicants. And so if you can avoid it, um, that's great. Sometimes you can't, but, but at least know that we're here as a resource for you and come to my office hours so that we can talk about it so that you don't just, you know, jump ship uh, without really knowing everything that's there. So then the next thing in your application is how do I explain it, right? Uh, because this is really a gap in your medical education. It, you may say, no, this was not a gap, but transferring from one school to the next, that is considered a gap. And, and worst case scenario is let's say you've had that gap and then your new medical school doesn't mention anything about your previous medical education, which you may think that that's good, um, that there's no mention of that. And so, you know, out of sight, out of mind, but well, that's really not the case because you've been to another medical school and we need to know what your dean thought about that and what was their logic behind allowing you to come into their um, to their medical school and to transfer in. So it's important to see how that's explained in your MSPE so that uh, so that you could be consistent and, and you could have a good interview as well. So having insight into your MSB and what that said about you is just it's got so many benefits. Um, so um, and it's going to help you be careful as you explain everything. And then you want to bring everything together in your personal statement, right? And that's where I think uh, a lot of um, a lot of really good work could be done. And it's gonna it's a it's a great time for for you and and uh, it's to reflect upon what happened and to start to accept it, feel comfortable with it, uh, and hopefully it was done all for the right reasons. All right, so IMG friendlies, we do have a really good video on this on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to watch it. This is just a you know, I'm gonna have a couple of slides on this because I know that a lot of you that are attending medical school abroad are being told, hey, listen, watch out for IMG friendly and, or apply to watch IMG friendly programs. And so what does that really mean? You know, um, I, IMG friendliness, I guess, um, I guess the, the idea is uh, it's, a, it's a notion that, you know, they're more receptive to an applicant who's, you know, from outside of the United States versus, versus inside. And certainly there are some programs that um, that uh, that uh, have majority U.S. Uh, medical graduates, but uh, almost every hospital in the United States, I don't know of a single hospital that does not have an international medical graduate um, uh, on their staff. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what makes it friendly or not. What if that one person that is an IMG is also in charge of the entire resident selection committee, but everybody else within the committee are not IMG. So, again, the, the variations are endless. And so, the only way that I've been able to make sense of this is you can get to friendliness by state. And so how many international medical graduates are there by state? 
how many international medical graduates are there by specialty, uh, and how many by the country of origin of the, um, of, the, of the candidate. So usually specialty is one of the things that you want to look at. And uh, amongst the top are, are internal medicine, um, you know, uh, 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 family medicine, uh, pathology, uh, psychiatry, um, neurology even. So there's a lot of international medical graduates there. So you're probably safe applying to, to those specialties uh, in the states that you have family and friends. Uh, and um, you know, it's a state that you see yourself living in. So again, that becomes your list of IMG friendlies. Um, there are some residency programs that, that offer visa sponsorship, but again, this can change all the time. They may say, we don't offer visa sponsorships right now, but then they say, well, for certain people, we would. Um, I'm speaking with a um, hospital CEO right now, and, and I know for a fact that their residencies don't um, like to sponsor visas. And I try to really get to the core of why would they not sponsor visas if they have so many international medical graduates as their faculty. And they said, look, it really comes down to cost. And uh, I said, well, you know, is there any way that if there's additional funding for, uh, for, for visa sponsorship, um, and if there's some funding that comes uh, for that, would you, would you be willing to sponsor visa? He says, you know, we would consider it. And so that in itself tells me that, look, they would make exceptions for, for certain candidates. And so that policy can change all the time. So we can't really, um, we can't really, rely fully on, on a list that we get or, or what's mentioned on, on Frida, because again, those are all surveys and who knows Phil, who filled out that survey and whether that person is still employed at that, at that residency or whether they ran that survey by a program director or an entire committee uh, before they sent it into Frida. And I guarantee you that the majority of them have not. And um, so there's probably a lot of bias in, in surveys that are filled out. So just kind of keep that in the, in the back of your mind. Um, there's a lot of residencies with, with international medical graduates that have matched into their program, right? Some have very few, even amongst internal medicine, where you know almost half of the, the residents are international medical graduates, but there are some internal medicine programs that, uh, that don't have that many international medical graduates. So you certainly need to um, know which ones uh, they are. The only way you would find out is if you call each one of the programs and, and, um, and, um, and find out what is the, the percentage of, of their IMGs there. Uh, and then we talked about uh, <clears throat> IMGs on staff. Now, what are the advantages of, um, let's say that you, let's say that you, you know, one of the things you'll hear from me is apply, once you have your application that is complete, apply to as many programs as you can afford with a complete application. There's four letters of recommendation that are strong. You know, the content of your MSV is, is written well and it's based on a 2017 uh, criteria, your, your ERAS application doesn't have any errors in it. It's very consistent with your personal statement. You can defend everything in there. Um, there's no errors in there. Uh, your ACLS, BLS, and PAL certified. Uh, we figured out all of your honors, which memberships you belong to, which societies you belong to, uh, what's your commitment to, to, a, to a particular specialty, all of that. That's what makes an application, uh, um, uh, complete. Now, so let's say that you do not um, apply to every single pro program that's there. Well, an advantage of that would be, I guess you would say $26 per program that you don't apply to. Um, and, um, you know, and so I I'm not sure after doing all of this work, if, if $26 per program, just to find out whether you get a yes or no for an interview, if that's, if that's good enough of a reason to not apply to programs, if you know you have a complete application. Uh, you know, the, the other thing is that you start to become familiar with the way that programs communicate. And so, and you'll learn that that just because they posted something online does not mean that uh, that that is the, uh, a hard set uh, rule. Uh, the issue of looking at a survey or looking at a list um, or or having to call someone and getting what their requirements are it's pretty much outdated as soon as you get it uh, because those things can change all the time. And again, it changes based on the applicant pool. If this year, if every year they've gotten twenty five hundred to three thousand applications, and this year they only got five hundred. Well, that's going to change the way they look at those 500 candidates and they're going to make a lot more, um, you know, exceptions. And, you know, if you certainly do not apply, that's definitely a no on, um, on uh, being considered for an interview. <clears throat> the next thing is, do you really have the time to search for each one of the programs? I, I didn't. I, there, there's, I mean, there's just so much and, and you don't get everybody on the phone and you just don't have enough time to do it. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of programs. There's, there's over 600 family medicine programs this year. How, how are you going to find the time to call every single one of them? Uh, and then how much is a single interview worth to you, right? So again, if you invest in applying to programs, all the ones that you can afford, uh, it's worth it. Um, 
much better than just looking at a list and and seeing um, which programs that you qualify for. Because again, in our admission committees, it, that's a very that's a moving target. Uh, and if, is your application unique? And and every single person that is that is applying to residency that has gone to a medical school abroad, even those that have gone to medical schools here in the United States, their applications are very very unique. And and, and this is a job application you're applying to. So we're going to look at the whole thing. We're going to look at the whole picture. Um, and uh, and we're going to want to know does your application measure up to the rest of our our, our candidate pool and the first group that we're going to look at are U.S. medical graduates, your seniors. Those are those are your true formidable competitors. Um, and um, you know, and let's say that you do call a program. Say, look, Mizani, I'm going to call the programs. I'm going to find out. I want to come up with the programs that I qualify for. Do you really trust the person who picks up the phone on the other side? And uh, you know, do they have the most updated information? So, anyways. We have a system that we recommend that you use in which programs to apply to. If you go to our YouTube channel, we just posted a 2020 main match residency tips and advice uh, for how to narrow your which programs that you apply to. So take a look at that. But again, at the end of the day, remember the best way not to get an interview is to not apply, right? So, um, all right. So with that being said, um, you know, just uh, some final reminders before we get into our question and answer session. Thank you so much for um for for uh being here with me and spending your time with me uh really important uh we have launched our residency prep academy which is an online resource for uh mainly for members there are some uh, resources for non-members as well we go through it take a look at it uh and uh the the newest one is the 2020 main match and residency prep a step-by-step -step guide so take a look at it uh the password protected pages uh is the password was shared with you when you were a when you first join the Mary Clerkships, and uh, if uh, if you don't have it, uh, there is a link there to to uh, get your updated password. And if you're not a member and you'd like to access those, then certainly uh, visit our memberships page uh, for how to become a member. Uh, we are going to be re-airing this uh, webinar, and I'm going to be uh, live chat moderating it on July 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the only way that you're going to know about it is if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you get an invitation. And then uh, you'll get uh, notices, and then you'll show up, and and it should be a, a fun event. So, with that being said, again, thank you, and I am going to um, we're going to work with Mr. Zellinger now, and we're going to go through some of your question and answers, and and I do have a list of your uh, questions as well, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so Tim, is there any specific questions that we can answer from um, from the chats here? Absolutely. There is a couple of great questions that I wanted to bring up with you. Uh, the first question that I was asked a little bit earlier on is, obviously you did a little bit of a talk about the Family Medicine Conference. Uh, there was a question that I was asking if there's an alternative uh, for internal medicine or maybe some other specialties. Are you aware of any other equivalent uh, kind of organizations for that? Yes, yes. So every organization that uh, you know, for our core specialties, uh, whether it be American College of Physicians, ACP, they just had a conference as well. There were there were um, a couple of hundred residency programs there, and there was some great feedback. So ACP is a, a really good organization. So um, ACP, um, the uh, you know our, our General Surgery Society, uh, American College of Pediatrics, uh, or American Academy of Pediatricians. Um, so there's uh, let me let me get the exact names for you. Hold on one moment. So for, let's go ahead and go right over here. Let me share my screen. So this is for ACP. Let's go to AC, uh, there we go, acponline.org. I think they just had their national conference. Yeah, they just had their national conference. So this is one you want to join them uh, and uh, see when their next uh, uh, session is. Uh, let me see. Uh, so American College of Surgeons, for those of you that are interested in surgery, you certainly want to join them and join their national conference. So there's a clinical conference. I don't know about that. ACH and HBS leaders. It's their national, it's usually the national conference for that society um, every year. And it's and they have multiple conferences every year. So make sure you're going to the national one and then call, like for example, ACS and call them 
and ask them, are there going to be residencies at this conference? And if they are, then certainly something that you want to you want to go to. AMSA, uh, the American Medical Association Students um, Branch, they they are uh, they also have uh, conferences every year uh, that uh, residency uh, programs uh, come to. American College of Pediatrics. Um, there you go. 2019 National Conference and Exhibition. This is October 25th. But yeah, so just find out if there's residency programs there, and and uh, and uh, you won't you won't regret going to them. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Mazzani. That was a great question. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, there's another small clarification. Uh, when you do go to a conference like this, uh, the question was, uh, should I bring a resume? Uh, I mentioned uh, business cards as well might be an idea. Can you go into kind of the conduct that you want to sort of uh, bring up during this as well? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that it's a good idea for you to walk around with a business card. I know that some, even some U.S. students do it. I don't think that that's a good idea at all uh, because it makes you look, uh, you know, too prepared to come in and uh, and make a deal, and that's not what this is really about. They there's still got to be that that casual feel to this, you know, meeting one on one and just kind of shaking their hands and getting a good feel about one another. And and whenever a medical student or a graduate walks around with a business card, that just doesn't leave a good feeling. So I don't recommend that you do that. Absolutely. But other than that, um, but other than that, as far as being prepared, you you want to have everything with you. Like you want to have your you know copies of your resume with you. I think that's a good thing to take with you. I think it's good. You know, I don't think you should wear your, um, I don't think you should wear your lab coat. Uh, but maybe wear your school ID badge. Uh, that that's probably not a bad idea if you're still a medical student. Uh, and then um, and then uh, walk from you know one residency to the next. Make sure you have a big bag because everybody's going to give you some paperwork. And, and, I, and don't spend more than two to three minutes. I know it's hard. It's nearly impossible to do it. But don't spend more than two to three minutes uh, with, with each program because there are so many places that you got to go to. And there's so many residency programs that you got to meet. And so um, you, just have to, you just have to be able to get to all of them. All right. Absolutely. Thanks for clarifying that, Dr. Mazzani. Um, we did get a lot of questions uh, regarding just, uh, you know, specific questions about what is a safe state to apply to with certain clerkships. And what came up was uh, a little bit about California and the recent developments of the PTAL letter. So if you want to speak directly to the PTAL letter, Dr. Mazzani, that'd be fantastic. I did link you the, uh, the notice that was posted uh, by the California State Medical Board. And if you want to just go into how that might affect uh, California being a safe, you know, state or not, that'd be great, uh, great help. So within limit, um, we have we have some information about uh, California, but this has not happened. We don't know how everything's going to play out as of January first. But yes, it is correct. You don't need PTAL anymore for the state of California. International medical students and graduates do not need to apply for PTAL anymore. Uh, and so with that, uh, also the list of recognized medical schools is going away. So um, so those are those are monumental changes when it comes to the state medical board like California. And and uh, uh, we've tried to contact them a couple of times just to go ahead and get some clarifications with regards to how it's gonna affect clinical clerkships, how it's going to affect, uh, you know, what happens, uh, you know, three years, four years, five years down the line when they apply to med medical licensure. And, and, um, and some of them didn't have really proper answers. But what we do know right now is that you can apply to California uh, without PTAL as of January 1st forward. Uh, how does that affect a 2020 uh, match? Well, if you're in the match already and it's not 2020 yet, the idea is that programs won't require you to have PTAL. So technically speaking, you should be able to apply to them and the program should not require a, um, a California letter from you and whether your medical school is on the list of recognized or not recognized does not should not make a difference. So those are all the things that we've been told. Hopefully that works out in practice as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Mazzani. And then in general, um, I know this, this chat came up quite a few times just and what is people are asking, what is uh, a safe state for them? Um, can you clarify on how, you know, you define a safe state to apply to? I know it's going to depend a lot uh, person to person, but if you want to go into that, 
that'd be fantastic. A safe state to apply to. I think um, I think state safety uh, will really vary from one student to the next because depends on where you went to medical school, for example. And just because California is doing away with its list of recognized medical schools doesn't mean Georgia is, doesn't mean you know New York is. And so they all would have um, those that have some sort of regulation, they're probably going to continue and it's gonna take them a few years for them to catch up. So for somebody, New York may be a very, very safe bet, but for some, it may not. So I can't give you that specific answer about which one is absolutely safe because you know, uh, it, I guess a state that does not require training license, uh, maybe that's one of them. Maybe a state that doesn't require uh, any sort of a license for you to get into residency, maybe that will be a safe state to apply to. Uh, but I think generally speaking, um, you know, if there's any sort of training license requirement for that state, then that you need to be aware of, uh, of uh, a lot of other factors. Um, so uh, most of the states that that we see uh, people apply to with with no need for a uh, training license, and again, this can change. Uh, like you know, um, uh, Georgia used to be one of them, but then they do require a training license now. Uh, Wyoming uh, was another one. Um, Illinois uh, has a, a verification that that needs to happen before you start residency for your clinicals. But um, you know, and that's some sort of a, a, a training license. But that seems to be, a, generally speaking, a safe state, um, unless your clinical rotations were done with no contract between uh, either the placement agency and the hospital, or your hospital and your medical school. So that could be a bit problematic. Um, Florida, uh, Florida is probably a, a good state to apply to, unless you've done your clinicals in Florida and you shouldn't have, that could be a problem. So again, it all depends on your background so that we see what would be safe for you. Uh, I would recommend that you sign up for an office hour and, and we, we discuss your case. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Mazzani. And I do recommend for everybody, a lot of the questions that are coming up in the chat are very specific, uh, like the, 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 the chat that came up about what a realistic application looks like to a competitive specialty like radiology. And Dr. Masani, I know you could probably go into a little bit about what a competitive application looks like in general, but then if they wanted to narrow their search down to a particular specialty, how they could go about doing that. So if you could go ahead and speak to a competitive application and what that looks like, that'd be fantastic. I would recommend um, for our medical students to take a look at the video that we have posted for 2020, um, for a 2020 residency application match, tips and advice, because that's what's going to be required for your application to be, uh, for the application package to be competitive. Um, there are, also there's this, there's a there's a lot of, of items that you need to check off. So if you're a member of American Chips, there is a checklist available on Residency Prep Academy, and that is on AC Medical Dojo Residency Prep. So I recommend there are two pages. So number one, make sure that you go through the main match and residency prep. There are 13 steps there. Um, not gonna get into every single uh, one of them right now, but I just wanna show you all the steps that need to be taken in order for your application to be considered um, complete, right? So there's 13 steps that needs to be taken. So once you go in here, just click on each one of these and, and you'll go through, um, you know, how does every step apply to you? So uh, to have a complete application, in summary, you would have to have four letters of recommendation. I know one of the questions was, well, what if I have three? What's the difference between three and four letters of recommendation? Um, our job uh, at Amer Clerkships is not to barely prepare you. Our job is to really be able to put you uh, next to uh, U.S. medical students and medical graduates and, and have you be able to compete. And if you are only left with three letters of recommendation, that that probably tells us and admission committees that you don't have enough clinical experiences and that's why you, were, you only have three letters of recommendation and that's all you could get. So there's a lot of indirect messages and underlying tones of, of uh, uh, you know, implications of what happens when you send three letters or you just do the minimums or 
you know, you're late a couple of weeks for a residency application, all those things will read in between the lines and, and it will make a big difference in, in, uh, in how, what we think about your application. So take a look at that 2020 main match and residency prep and those 13 steps in it. That's going to be pretty helpful. And then this page, which I can't really open it up for you. There are, there are so many steps over here that you would just need to check off in order to make sure that your application is ready before you certify it. And that's, uh, that's going to outline exactly all the, uh, the, uh, what's going to make your application competitive. Uh, so uh, there's just the, the, the summary is there's a lot more to it than just how do I make my application competitive, it's clinicals, letters, what your ERAS is put together, when you apply, your MSBE, what your school does for you, there's just a lot. So either become a member, would love to have you, or if you're already a member, please go into each one of these pages and, and take a look at them. I think you'll, you'll really enjoy reading them. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Rosani. Sure. All right. So uh, there were question was asked early on uh, regarding uh, recency of graduation. So obviously in this particular webinar, you were addressing recent graduates. And the question was more along the lines of when it comes to recent graduates, how uh, long after medical school does that recency start to become a problem uh, necessarily? Is it, is it one year? Is it two years? Is it three years? Can you kind of speak to the gap uh, after graduation, how long uh, of, a, of a kind of a window do you have to apply as well as a recent graduate? Okay, sure. Uh, and I will address that in just a moment. Um, I just realized that I was not sharing my screen uh, when I was answering that previous question about what makes an application competitive. So I'm just going to reply and, and, and just show this to you just so that you know for AmeriClicks members, you know where to go. So our Residency Prep Academy, this is the link, uh, acmedical.org forward slash residency prep. And when you go there, you'll notice that there's multiple options here on the right hand side. And you just click them. And I'm just going to show you the first one, for example, a step-by-step -step guide of, of a successful match. And there are 13 steps in here. And the question was, how do I make my residency application complete and competitive? So I want you to go through every single one of these steps and really familiarize yourself with each one of them uh, and click them, open them up. It goes you know, from a timeline of 24 months before till now and just read through them. And, uh, uh, and I think that this is going to be very, very helpful. And then there's on this step two, for example, there's a checklist to plan and, and strategize. Uh, this is really important because once you click that, it takes you back to this document. I can't open this right now, uh, just for confidentiality and for our member protection. But when you click on the main match pre-application checklist, that's the list that you want to go ahead and check off to know that you have a competitive application or not. So uh, for those of you that are wondering how to make your application competitive, these are the two resources that I have for you that I strongly recommend you go to and then check off. So now your question again, Tim, now please. Yes, fantastic, no, thank you. Uh, the question was uh, regarding just recency of graduation. How long after graduation does that gap start to become a problem? People were asking, you know, obviously this uh, webinar was about uh, people who are under two years uh, in recency, but after two years, after three years, after four years, can you kind of speak to that gap and how long after graduation really starts to affect your application? Sure. Um, I sound like a broken record, but it really has to do with the person. Uh, we have some uh, individuals that have just graduated from medical school a year ago, but they haven't done anything at all. And, uh, and so that year is a problem. We've had individuals that graduated from medical school seven, eight years ago, and they've been practicing in their country. They've done residency, they've done a fellowship, and, and uh, their time has been filled. And then they're, they're going back and forth between the United States and, and, uh, and, and their country, and they're doing some clinicals here, and they're doing their clinicals there. And so for them, that's not as significant of an issue as somebody who's just not done anything. So it all really depends. Um, there is this arbitrary five-year um, you know, graduation. There is no such a cutoff. I mean, uh, some they may tell you that, but uh, it all depends on what the application um, uh, is, is all about and the contents of that application. So I think it's really important that you um, that, that, that we, we, we don't lose sight of the, of the most important thing in an application, which is the quality of the applicant. So when does it become problematic? Even 30 days could be problematic. Uh, so if you have, so even 30 days could be problematic. So if you have, uh, because you're going to be asked to explain any, any gaps over 30 days in your license application, in your, um, uh, in your hospital privileges package. So when does that become a problem? When when there there are too many months that you can't explain. Uh, and what is too many months? It, it, it all depends on how the overall application looks. The rule of thumb is that 
uh, if you have gaps and you're unable to explain it, like let's say, for example, let's say you're on asylum and you came to the United States and that process took two and a half, three years, right? So it's a story that, you know, if they really like the rest of your application, they may listen to you. And so your job is to then front load your application with a lot of recent experiences so that hopefully they would be a little bit more sympathetic to your situation and they would empathize and then they would look at the applicant and say, okay, well, I see that those three years are unexplained, but you know, recently you've had six months of clinical experiences. Maybe those are, that's a little bit more significant than, uh, than having us, you know, focus on those three years. If you can explain what happened in the three years, like, you know, if it makes sense, if it's just completely unexplainable, then, and you're going to make the program chase after an answer, then that's a problem. So a personal statement is a good place to talk about it. But um, I, I don't think that there is a, a definitive cutoff for when it's a problem, when it's not. Um, I, I think that regardless, you should be focusing on on giving the programs what they're looking for right now and, and just putting uh, four letters of recommendation from recent activities um, together and having a complete application all around, um, which takes some time to do, which takes some time to do, and we're here to help you uh, every step of the way. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Razani. And what you just mentioned four letters of recommendation, and this came up quite a bit in the chat, just what is the greatest uh, number of LORs, what are the best LORs to get in terms of do you need four in the same specialty or two in the same specialty and two in others? Can you speak to just, you know, why four is a good number or why four in the same specialty might be even better and just sort of how that breaks down? Well, the reason why I like four is because that's how many letters you can submit. And so um, it, it, tells the programs, look, I have four uh, people that are willing to recommend me to, to residency. And you can upload a lot more than four, of course, but you can up, we can submit up to four letters per program. So take advantage of that. Why send less? Uh, some programs will say a minimum of three, but again, you're not in a position to be given programs minimums with so many competitive applicants. So that's one of the, the main reasons why why four is important. I think you should have you should collect a lot more than four letters of recommendation because the majority of letters that are written, majority of letters that are written are not that strong, or even though they sound like it's a good letter, but they're really more of a character reference. And they don't say anything specific about your particular clinical experience. They say nothing specific about you. Like when I read it, I the test, the litmus test that I use is could I see the exact same sentence about another person at that clinical site? Like, can I see this exact same sentence about another person? And if I can, if it's not specific to you, then I know that probably it was a template or maybe it was copy and pasted. And so you need to just be aware of that. And I know physicians are busy. I know how busy they are. I get it. But at the end of the day, you need to have insight into your, into your application and, and you need to have backup letters, four letters, Four letters, you just need to have backup to a backup to a backup. Um, so I recommend that you have at least six letters of recommendation, at least six, and um, and we take a look at it and we analyze it and then we pick the best four for that specialty. And preferably you would have started this process a couple of years in advance, so it wouldn't be a surprise to you just the last couple of months before September 15th, because don't forget, it's not just you looking for letters before September 15th, it's a majority of, of medical students and graduates, that's, I mean, these physicians are getting bombarded and this is summertime. So guess what, guess where everybody goes? They go on vacation, right? It could be announced, it could be unannounced, they could get sick, the physician could stop practicing, they could forget about you. So what are you gonna do if you wait that long? So you have to have backup letters. So four is the, is what I, what you should end up with at the end, but you need more than four. You need a lot more than four, uh, just so that you can protect yourself from, from all different angles. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mazzani. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, there are two more questions that were asked are a little bit more specific, but I think that everybody could certainly benefit from them. I think this question in regards to if a student applies for a categorical position, but they actually are offered a preliminary position instead, what are the options after completing PGY-1? So can you discuss a little bit about the categorical preliminary distinction and what to do in the situation you get a preliminary position? Um. I'm not sure if I fully understand the context of this question because a program doesn't just offer you unless they're outside of the match. So did you apply to a preliminary and a categorical position and, and then you matched into a preliminary? The, I need to know about that. So if, if the person that asked this question, are they here, Tim? I believe, yes, I believe Rahul is still here. So Rahul, if you're still here, 
Uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute your mic and go ahead and clarify for Dr. Mazzani. All right. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. This is Rahul here. Yes. Hello. So please, yeah, tell me about this uh, the preliminary position and categorical your question. Yes. Yeah, so um, I wasn't I wasn't aware that you could have the situation where you apply to both categorical and preliminary and you're offered preliminary. But I'm um, saying that situation where you're offered preliminary and you where you match into preliminary and you did not match into the categorical that you uh, apply to. What could you do after PGY1 in order to complete your residency? OK, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Raul, you, the only reason why you would apply to both a preliminary and a categorical in, in one program is, um, I mean, there's, there's very, very limited scenarios that that, that, that that is OK to do. Usually, in the case of internal medicine, for example, if the program is highly, highly competitive, highly competitive, majority in you know, U.S. medical grads, um, you know, some of the scores really, really high, really high board passing rates, and they say, look, you know, also apply to our preliminary. We we may see if we have any interviews there. Um, that scenario is very rarely seen in in programs across all you know the thousands of programs. You see some internal medicine do that. You see some general surgery programs do that because um, a, general surgery, a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of residents don't make it through PGY-1. And so they need backups. And uh, and so a lot of first place that they go to in general surgery, they go right into their preliminary pool of residents and they see if there's anybody there that can bring in as PGY-2. So we see that happening uh, often in general surgery programs. But outside of that, if you apply to both preliminary and categorical to a program, you're sending a message telling them that, A, I'm applying to both, I'm interested in internal medicine, and I'm also interested in another specialty. Because the only reason for a preliminary, the only reason why preliminary exists is to cater to advanced specialties. Neurology, interventional uh, radiology, uh, neurodevelopmental disability, diagnostic radiology, some anesthesia program, some child neurology program. Those are the only ones that, uh, and a couple other specialties, but those are the ones that require PGY-1 beforehand. So, um, so we could, we could play the hypothetical and say, you did the opposite of what I'm saying and you applied to IM categorical and preliminary and you rank the preliminary. Well, when you rank a preliminary, it's gonna ask you, where is the advanced? And you're gonna have to figure out what the advance is. And you know, let's assume that you pick an advanced specialty and, and, and you, you put that on your rank order list or you don't put a rank, uh, a special advanced specialty on your rank order list. If you end up with a preliminary, if you do, um, then you're going to have to go through the entire match process again uh, next year, and you're going to have a pretty tough time. Um, you know, and if you go through the match process again, you're going to have to apply to categoricals, which means that most likely, most likely, you're going to have to repeat PGY one, depending on the specialty that you match into, and you're going to have to apply to advanced positions, which means you're going through the match twice next year. So I don't recommend that you apply to preliminary. Um, at all, I recommend that you stick with categorical if you if you're not considering an advanced position, and it's not a good idea to think about multiple specialties. That's not a good idea at all. You need to pick one specialty, and you need to stick with it. You need to show commitment to that specialty. And the IM preliminary is not the same specialty as IM categorical. IM preliminary is the base for an advanced specialty. Does that answer your question, Roel? Yeah, yeah. Um, I that that answers it. Uh, yeah, I do understand that now. So um, that was in um, context of general surgery. Um, it wasn't in the context of applying to multiple specialties. Um, I hadn't completely understood that it's not a case of where you apply for categorical and they offer you preliminary. It doesn't work like that. But um, yeah, that was particularly um, with reference to general surgery. I've, I've seen um, in the past 20 years, I may have seen maybe you know, two to three times where uh, somebody's applied to categorical and the program says, look, apply to our preliminary and surgery, apply to our preliminary and we'll see if there's any slots. Or they go for a categorical interview and they say, look, we don't have any more slots. We're, we're not going to be able to rank you high enough. Maybe we'll rank you in preliminary. That may happen, but that's after the interview has already been granted. And those are very, very unique circumstances. And if that happened to you, please, you know, uh, you know, come to us, and, and if you're a member of American we can help you. 
decipher it. All right. Um, and just a quick follow up on that. So, um, if um, so, for applying to general surgery, um, categorical does doing all of your um co rotations, um, as an international medical student in the U.S. Does doing all of your co-rotations help more towards um, getting a categorical position in general surgery? Um, well, not just doing all of your cores, but doing all of your clerkships in the United States, absolutely. It, it makes a huge difference because, um, you know, not just in general surgery, but, but strongly recommended that you do some electives in surgery, um, you know, some of the surgery subspecialties. So you would need to order that properly and, and, uh, and correctly. It depends on what letters of recommendation say. So. It's not just the clinicals, but it's the all the other things that come with it. The letters of recommendation, the US clinical experience, the US surgical experience, um, your interview performance is going to improve significantly, all of the above. Uh, but it all depends on how you, you do those clinicals, where you do them, what's your, what's your title during those clinicals? Are you doing a full credit? Are you doing it as an observer? Are you getting to scrub into the, uh, the operating room? Are you able to just, is it just an outpatient surgery? It, it all makes a difference. So, uh, but generally speaking, doing clinicals in the United States, if it's done the right way, um, far is, is far more beneficial than not doing it. Significant. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've, you know, the chances of somebody who's never done any clinicals in the United States, getting into residency, especially general surgery, I've never seen one. Okay. Thank you so much, Raul, for that question. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. We just have a few final questions here. Uh, Dr. Mazzani, there was a question earlier about your thoughts on the combined DO and MD match and how it might affect IMGs moving forward. I know that it was specifically about this year, but just moving forward, I just wanted to get your uh, impression on that. Uh, from what I understand that the AOA match is telling, um, is telling, uh, their osteopathic, uh, senior students and graduates that there's not going to be an AOA match anymore. So for everybody to go through, um, uh, NRMP. So that's one of the, the, the major changes. So all the timeline is not just unified, whether you're allopath or osteopath. So that's the same. Um, as far as combining residencies, uh, you know, it's it's streamlining the process. Uh, still pretty new. It started in 2015, and it's supposed to end uh, June of next year. Uh, lots of new slots that are made available in in ERAS now. So, uh, you know, if there's any specific questions that you have with regards to this this matchup, then I'll be able to answer. But generally speaking, those are just some you know bird's eye view of what's happening. All right. Absolutely. All right. And then the last uh, question that was asked was there was uh, there's been a little bit of information out on the Internet regarding the USMLEs uh, starting to becoming less important due to initiative that's starting uh, starting up here soon. Uh, I, can you speak to that a little bit? I know that's been something that's been floating around on the Internet for a while now. Sure. So USMLEs were never meant to be a residency entry um, or a selection tool, USMLE scores. Uh, they were meant to be for medical license uh, uh, and your readiness for medical licensure, which is the reason it's called United States Medical License Examination. And so over the years, there have been a growing number of medical students uh, that are complaining in the United States. Again, this is United States Medical License Examination. Um, a growing concern that there are, A, there's more and more residency programs are, are looking at scores to kind of differentiate uh, between candidates and and they don't think that that is fair because that's not a direct representative of how good some a position is going to be and then uh the next complaint is that there is you know over emphasis on scores is too stressful uh for them and so usmle listen and uh and it seems like uh there's a there's a there's a plausible possibility that they are going to switch to pass fail not set in stone but there is a, a real possibility that by this time next year um, there is a, a big possibility that, that it will be, uh, well on its way for us some of these scores to go away. Uh, is it going to, uh, is it going to happen? Not sure. I mean, that's a really, really big change. Uh, but, uh, but that's what's certainly been, um, discussed and that's available online. You're correct. It's pretty, uh, well publicized. So, um, some love it, some don't. 
if you're over relying on your USMLE score as the means by which to differentiate you from the other candidates, you're going to be sadly surprised that that most of the programs, that's not what they do. And if you're continuing to get that type of advice that high scores get interviews, that's probably going to become less and less relevant um, moving forward, especially with this new initiative. And then also when you look at the NRMP program director survey, you'll notice that there is a lot of factors that rank more important than USMLE scores that you haven't even thought about. Like for example, in family medicine, letters of recommendation from family physicians in the United States are more important on a scale of one to five. This is according to the 2018 program director survey. Letters of recommendation from family physicians in the United States are more important than your USMLE step one or USMLE step two CK scores. And where, but when you look at internal medicine, it's it's the opposite. But you know, so I just think about the specialty you're applying to. Scores are not the only thing you should be that's going to make us great doctors. There's a lot that goes into being a great doctor, and and I want you to look at everything so that you're very well rounded and and you're very well prepared for everything that that residency is going to require of you um, to be strong residents and and strong workers. All right, fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mazzani. Uh, the last question that came up uh, just right at the end here was uh, this is a follow up on your LOR question. Uh, uh, one of the members here has said that some people uh, have been telling them that. You waive your LOR, it's become, or if you don't waive your your rights as your LOR, then it becomes useless. Um, obviously, uh, in our experience, that's not been the case, but I want you to just kind of clarify a little bit more about that. Yeah, great uh, question. Uh, one of the resources that's available here, and it's available to the public. There we go. One of our resources that we have, LOR, Letters of Recommendation. I want you to click this. And this, by the way, on, on Residency Prep Academy. And when you click this, uh, right about here, should I waive my right to see my letter of recommendation or not? Um, not true that if you don't waive your right, your letter is worthless. Not true at all. There are factors to consider for you when you want to waive your right, and there are factors for you to consider when you're deciding to uh, not waive your right. So take a look at these two and make a decision on your own. And they're all mentioned here. I want you to go through them. Um, as a rule of thumb, uh, American Clerkships does not recommend that you waive, like uh, that you waive your right to see the letters. Um, for the reasons that are mentioned on this page, but also another reason why it's uh, we, we say for you not to waive your right is because we already know that a majority of people that say that their letters of recommendation were waived, um, majority of them have already seen their letters of recommendation. And so it's not truly waived. So, and that's especially the case for uh, a lot of uh, both US or international medical um, students and graduates. So that's one thing. Um, and then secondly, if you're an international medical student and you don't have a lot of letters of recommendation to really pick from, from recent clinical activities, every bit matters. And so if if this attending physician that agreed to write your letter of recommendation misspells your name or puts the wrong date in there or calls you a he where you're a female and uh, just puts a completely different name in there and these things happen all the time, or, or if it's not a good writer at all, and uh, and if you don't get any interviews, how would you ever know where the problem is? So having insight into your application is critical. And finally, the reason why a lot of people, a lot of physicians, I'm just going to talk about physicians. One of the reasons why a lot of physicians, um, I'm not going to categorize everybody in there, but a lot of the physicians say for you to go ahead and waive your right is yeah, they, they do believe that that's going to improve your chances, which I don't necessarily agree. If you don't get an interview, it's not because you didn't waive your right to see the letter. It's probably because there's much more significant problems in your application. But if you, but that also means that you don't get to go back and forth with the physician to have them change anything. So that saves them a lot of time. So I think that um, you know, if you have an, if you play an active role from the beginning in with the physician with regards to the uh, letter of recommendation. Uh, and you kind of plan it out properly from the start, I think that's going to make a, a big difference in, in what you get and, and what the quality of your letter of recommendation is. 
So we have a link here on requesting and securing letters of recommendation. And in this link, it goes week by week by week of what we want you to do. And you'll notice that by the end of week two, we ask, we ask you to ask them for a five minute mid clinical performance feedback based on ACGME core competencies. Right, and you ask them, you know, to give you that type of feedback. And if you do, then by the end of third week, you ask them, you know, how have you been performing and what kind of, um, you know, what kind of uh, improvements you've made. And by the beginning of week four, if everything is going great, you ask them whether they can support you and, and offer you a letter of recommendation. And if there's there in any way that you know you could have it by the end of this week. So if you do all of this then your chances of walking away with a really good letter of recommendation that is ACGME core competency based and you've had an input in, in what direction you want it to be in is gonna be a lot better. But majority of people don't do this. Majority of people just wait until, um, you know, they go back months or maybe years later to the physician to write a letter of recommendation. I strongly recommend that you focus on number six on increasing your odds of walking away from each rotation with an ACGME core competency based letter of recommendation in hand because at the end of the day, this is your life. This is your future. If you don't control it, certainly this is not at the top priority of physicians to do it. They're just great physicians. Their job is not to help you get into residency. That's just purely community service on their behalf. All right, fantastic. Okay, sounds good. I think that is all of the questions. I'm just checking the chat now to make sure nothing else is in there, but it looks like you've answered everything, Dr. Zion. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, I appreciate everybody being here. And uh, if you have not had your question answered, and if you're a member of Mayor Clerks, please make sure you come to our office hours. Otherwise, thank you so much. I had another great session. And uh, and uh, thanks for being members of Mayor Clerks. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.